Hello everyone, we are back with yet another episode of Computer Vision Talks and today we have with us Prof Gul and we are going to discuss four of her papers and the talk is going to be centered around what can we learn from subtitled sign language data and uh, to know a little about our speaker today, Gul is a research faculty at the IMAGINE, Imagine, is that right? Imagine, Imagine yeah. Imagine team of Ecole de Pont Paris Tech. I am. I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. Uh, previously, she was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oxford (VGG). She obtained her PhD from the Willow team of Infria Paris and Ecole Norm Normale Supérieure. Her research is focused on human understanding in videos, especially action recognition, body shape, and motion analysis and sign languages. So yeah, we've uh, we are glad to host you, Prof, and uh, I'm I'm really happy that you agreed to discuss all your work with us. And I'm sure that we're going to learn a lot. And the flow is that first we are going to uh, discuss all the papers, and in the last ten minutes, as uh, she has graciously agreed, we'll be asking all our PhD related doubts. Thank you so much. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much also for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, well, yeah, as you said already, this will be about sign language and primarily about subtitled sign language data. So I'll just define what that is in a minute. But first of all, a very, very brief uh, list of facts or like a kind of a background on what sign languages are and what they are not. So they are, sign languages are visual spatial languages, so you can think of them as special temporal signals when recorded, especially from a camera. And they have grammar and lexicon that are different than spoken languages. Um, quite different than spoken languages, they use multiple articulators, so hence not just their shape, but their location and movement, as well as all the upper body, facial expressions, mouth, the head and the torso movements, they matter a lot. And they're not universal, a typical example being American and British sign languages uh, that are different, although both surrounded by um, spoken English um, language, uh, they evolved separately for sign languages. And they're not finger spelling, so they're not just manual alphabet and letter by letter, they have uh, whole signs for, um, for terms like, uh, well, not, I, I don't want to say words, but uh, for concepts, there are signs and they can correspond to words or phrases or sentences. And they're not gestures, so they're not just um, accompanying speech, they're um, sign languages separate. And just to give a, a few brief examples uh, to illustrate here is um, to, to show how important the hand movement is and a sign from British Sign Language, BSL. When you say I ask you and you ask me, the movement of the hand can determine the subject-object relationship. So that's very subtle and um, in a computer vision perspective, this is what we, are sh we should be capturing in, a, in an automatic model to understand sign language. Um, another kind of um, example to show the importance of a subtle cue is the eye gaze. So when a very similar sign in BSL again for God involves um, in terms of hand shape can differ by just um, the eye gaze so looking above and uh, front can change the meaning and if you can imagine that with 2d key points that you extract from pixels you cannot capture such information so you really need um, more detailed signal there and just a few lists of uh, domains that this research is related to so although it sounds like this niche topic it actually relates to many uh, broader aspects of machine learning and computer vision, such as translation between languages. Now we're working on translation between a video, a special temporal signal and text, for example. Um, like even learning the video representations, how to communicate this to the computer, um, the input itself is challenging. So it relates to all the human specific um, tasks, such as pose estimation, lip reading, and also because of the nature of the data, which is always a uh, low resource, you also have to um, inspire from weekly semi low shot uh, learning scenarios, semi supervised and weekly supervised. All right, so why are we doing this research? So there are um, questionable and useful um, applications. So hopefully the ones I'm listing are the useful ones, but um, one thing which has been problematic, uh, identified problematic by the deaf communities is that um, 
the researchers should consult uh, the deaf communities before coming up with research ideas to make sure they're working on useful problems. And um, yeah, some of them I'm listing here are about um, especially uh, tools to support learners. Um, so any, any way the technology can help there. And also when you search, uh, if you could efficiently search by text um, or by a video input, a corpus of sign language data, that this would be uh, useful. And also for supporting linguistic analysis of the language, uh, constructing automatic uh, data sets and helping the manual annotation, which is currently very expensive for linguists and experts. Um, and even a semi-automatic way, helping this process would help save them a lot of time. Also, a lot of the technology we're surrounded by are um, designed for speech activation, voice activation, such as Alexa or Siri, and having them respond to signing would be also useful for um, deaf communities. Okay, so these were kind of an introduction. Let me briefly also summarize why this is challenging, because sometimes when I talk to people, it just sounds a very trivial problem to them, um, just like another computer vision classification task. But uh, let's go through a few of them. And hopefully you'll agree that it's not trivial. Um, so first of all, the um, sign language is, as I said, multi-channel. So there are multiple articulators, hands and face and heads. Um, you have to capture all the, all the channels and merge them uh, to, to get the meaning out of it. And then there's this problem uh, of data being always focusing on isolated signs so far, which is on the left, whereas continuous signing, which uh, we mean by co-articulation, is the more natural way of signing because the, you have, you're making full sentences and meanings, not just single sign. And that means you're usually faster and there could be motion blur when you're recording by a camera. And the appearance of the sign is influenced by the previous, of, like depends where you're left, uh, you're, you left your hand, you start from there for the next sign. So you can, um, there's a lot of combinations that can happen in the transitions. Uh, well, another challenge, particularly for machine learning, is that um, there are lots of variations in the language. So for the same um, meaning, for example, for, different, for the same color, there could be multiple signs. And this can be depending on regional variances or um, just depending on context. You can be formal version, informal version, and so on. And here, for example, you see different versions of the sign before. Uh, to me, quite one of the most important challenge currently that we have to overcome is the data. So just listing a few data sets here, then there have been many more that came, came out um, after this, um, the slide was prepared basically. Um, but really the most limiting thing is either the signs are isolated, so they're not reflecting the real world domain, um, and they are, or they have very limited vocabulary, so you only have 100, 200 signs, although there are thousands of signs in the lexicon. Uh, or when they have thousands of signs, there's only one or three video per, some, per, per sign, so it's not enough to train uh, data-hungry um, machine learning models. So we need a lot of instances per sign and a lot of signs, and in a natural setting, ideally. So, in, in our series of work in the past uh, two years, almost, uh, we've been looking at uh, interpreted TV data. So, just caution that this is also not natural because it's on TV and it's in a specific context, but at least it's, it's a step towards um, continuous and open vocabulary domain. And the advantage is that it's uh, kind of available in most many sign languages. And uh, in our work, we've specifically uh, focused on British Sign Language, but hopefully the, the methods are apl applicable to, to any of them, provided there is data. Um, so just a brief uh, list of challenges for leveraging this kind of data, specifically when you have a video and a corresponding subtitle. What happens is that this subtitle is only corresponding to speech, so it's transcribed from the audio. But then the interpretation of it can be uh, lagging a few seconds or it can um, slightly change the meaning 
it's not temporally aligned to the uh, to the video content, the, the subtitle content. And then even if it's aligned, um, it doesn't guarantee you a list of signs. It's just a translation. It's not sign by sign transcription. And um, the mapping of these um, signs to words in the subtitle is quite complex. There's a many to many mapping. And then even if there was a sign, like one sign per word, uh, the order of the, the words in the subtitle in spoken language uh, is quite different than the order of signs in sign language. So because of the different grammar and uh, syntax, um, so this is another challenge. And finally, maybe a quite important one is the size of both the spoken and the signed language uh, vocabulary. So the number of words, for example, in the subtitles can be about 40,000 and several thousands for sign language as well. All right, uh, with that, I'll begin to summarize a few um, follow-up follow works, which was initiated by this one in ECCV 2020. Um, so it's always a collaboration with uh, University of Oxford. And uh, yeah, I was also postdoc at the time with Sam, Lily, Jaffe, and Junson, Neil, and Andrew in this work. Uh, the idea, well, the observation is that the signers, especially the ones on, that are interpreting, um, are sometimes mouthing the words while signing. So you can speak, think of it like silent speaking, but it's not speaking, speaking the whole sentence, but some words, especially when there's a ambiguity involved or um, for certain words when the mouth is not as involved in the sign. Um, so the idea is that we have some candidate words in the subtitle that tells us that around this search window, there could be, for example, the word happy in this, uh, in this case. And we look at the lip region and try to localize precisely in time where that word happens. So we do this for uh, all the words in the subtitle. Are you happy with this application? So all not, in practice, not all, but the ones that are likely to have a sign um, mapping. So you look, we look for the word happy in maybe more than 10 seconds window, but we localize it pre precisely in less than a second window. And usually when they mouth, um, the sign also synchronously happens. So we have a localization semi-automatically, well, purely automatically, assuming you have subtitles, basically. And with that, we run it on all the subtitle words um, and collect the initial uh, version of the BSL 1K dataset. Uh, for which we split into training and test. So the training is automatically annotated using these mouthing cues. I'm just showing a few examples for the word happy. So you can see that they're synchronized in the hands, not just uh, the mouth. This is the sign for problem. And with that, we have annotated at the time about 200,000 instances, such uh, short clips uh, automatically on the training set. What we could do is to train on this uh, sign classification. So the vocabulary at the time was 1,000 signs, 1,000 way classification using this data and apply on um, our manually verified separate test data. So a few examples at the top for the success case, which I will skip more quickly because, okay, they're, they're good. And below are some failure cases where you have, maybe I should, yeah, where you have the prediction sausage, although the ground truth was chips. And in blue, you see an example from the training set for the, um, for sausage. And you can see that there are similar manual features. And the ones I'm showing are the most confident failure cases. So 0, 90 in the parentheses means it's 90% um, probability assigned to it. So it's similar for the uh, West and Wednesday, the hands and in here you have uh, groupings in terms of similar mouthing happy and happen three and three they even have something in common in the hands in this case so these are the most confident failures hopefully we'll go to the next slide yeah uh, so well there are many experiments in the paper but one key uh, conclusion from this work was that you could train on this psl1k um, which is completely free, automatically labeled, 
and fine-tuned on other downstream data sets, in this case, American Sign Language Benchmarks, WLASL and MSASL, uh, where you get consistent boosts if you um, compare it to not pre-training. Not pre for example, the blue is kinetics action recognition pre-trained. It's a completely different uh, task. And here you have ESL 1K pre-trained, and it was uh, quite a large boost. And we've, com we've uh, done this comparison on many other data sets later, and it was consistently better to pre-train. And the model is online, if you want to play with it. Right, so this was the um, first part, which was giving us a good um, starting point uh, using the mouthing signal. But a, a big limitation is that not all the signs are mouth so you can miss some of the vocabulary just because you didn't annotate them in the training set enough and also because this model is kind of distilling the mouthing it also pays a lot of attention to mouth at test time although there's a question yeah so uh, i was asking that when we're talking about mouthing is it speaking the same things in english or in that language or sign language or is it sign specific language the mouthing well, in this case, it's British Sign Language and its sur surrounding spoken language is English. So when so they sign some... happy, it's, you see the word happy, but it's not the same as the speaking. Sometimes they just mouth a few syllables, for example. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah, that was important. Um, and then, yeah, maybe I haven't mentioned that this lip um, keyword spotting model, which is only looking at the lip, is trained on audiovisual data where you have speaking people that you just remove the sound, um, but it has never seen sign language data. So there is already a domain gap there, but we found it works already pretty good. Um, right. So, yeah, as I said, this mouthing is not enough if you want to really capture all the all the signs and also make the models more pay attention to other cues than mouthing. Uh, with that motivation, we came up with this uh, follow up work at ACCV 2020. Um, the main idea is that it's um, in this case, the goal is given a dictionary input. So there are sign language dictionaries where you have word and sign uh, pairs but maybe one video per sign or in this case words uh, that you can search for and the goal is finding it finding that sign in a continuous video which can be also like 10 20 seconds and this is the result when it's coloring up it's the um, the sign strong so we'll play a game I'm not sure how it shows up in your screen, but try to um, try to spot the first sign, which will appear as a dictionary isolated sign, quite slow, and the second continuous one, a bit faster. So you'll try to spot that. That means accept. Okay, I guess that was an easy one. Oops, but yeah. that's still. Uh, let's still play the result. Accept. Okay. Another one, which is more subtle. Happy. You've seen this sign. Let's see the result. It was compared to the dictionary one. It's really subtle because it's it's much faster. So, well, you get the idea. Do you, you have a question? No, no, uh, very interesting representations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so here, well, let's, let's say, let's more formulate it um, formally, where the goal is given a dictionary video, compute some embedding from it, a fixed size d-dimensional feature vector, and a continuous signing where you have also the temporal dimension. So here it's just a single vector per dictionary because there's a single sign we know, but here there are multiple signs in time. And we want to find the similarity between these two and such that the, um, the maximum similarity peaks at the moment that um, where the sign apple appears in the long one. 
Um, so yeah, the, the challenges are maybe some of them are obvious. So the dictionary, as you, you saw, is very slow and quite a different domain. It starts from a rest pose, does the sign and comes back, whereas the continuous is, is much faster and co-articulated. So uh, I won't go into detail what we came up with. We, we've kind of followed the, the work from the CEPR 20 paper below. Uh, which is based on multiple instance learning and contrastive estimation. We try to use all the signals that we have. One is from the previous work mouthing, by just watching and looking, we can localize some of the signs, we know where they are. From the subtitles, we can also get candidate words, we know uh, that they might happen. So, for example, uh, we know that there should be the, the word oven somewhere, and maybe we've already uh, spotted it with mouthing. So we query the, the dictionary words uh, videos for the word oven and we say, okay, these blue ones, they should match. So we learn embedding such that the distance between this and this is minimized. And then we also have the negative bags. We know that if it happens here, it shouldn't happen the other places. And also there are some signs like temperature which we have never localized, like we haven't localized in this sequence with mouthings, but we know that it's somewhere in this video. So we say, okay, um, the sum of the, the, we kind of, it's a bag approach where we, it's a, that's why it's a multiple instance. We know it should be somewhere and at least one of them should match, but we don't know where they are. So we make a bags of, bags of positives and negatives. But yeah, for more details, I encourage you to look at the paper. So the general idea is to learn a matching between dictionary domain and the continuous domain. And the, the results were quite satisfactory. So here are some baselines and the, the final result on the, on the last column. Uh, the main comparison to me is the first one and the last one, which would be training embeddings only for sign classification. So this 1000 classification from the previous work, for example, you can still use them to compute distance between dictionary and um, continuous, but this was quite suboptimal. Uh, what helped most was to uh, learn this embedding by training jointly on both the dictionary and the and the, um, continuous. So we didn't even use classification loss in this one, just matching or not matching. There's a question uh, in the chat: Is the goal? to perform isolated sign language recognition or continuous? I mean, in the test set. Well, yeah, that's a good question. The ultimate goal is continuous, but currently with these two works that I've presented, it's just to spot signs, the location of the signs in a continuous stream. Because we have no data, large scale data, where we can have continuously annotated uh, signs. And this is a step towards that to have so now we have maybe one word per sentence annotated and we come up with another method uh, all, like a teach project i'm going to present we come up with another method to maybe find another word in that sentence so it's two words out of the subtitle three words out of the subtitle and eventually the goal is to find to solve continuous recognition and even translation into text but currently what we do is uh we we have a proxy evaluation where we evaluate recognition, isolated recognition on continuous signing data. So given a very short clip um, to answer whether it's like well, which which sign it corresponds to. I don't know if it's confusing or not. Okay. Well, and uh, thanks for asking. This is also uh, a good question. But yeah, in the previous work, I've shown, for example, these downstream tasks on ASL datasets, they were isolated. But it's not the ultimate goal. It's more like to evaluate the representation quality for now. Okay. Um, yeah, the nice thing with what this plot is showing that uh, before we were having annotations with mouthings, which you can see, for example, uh, that can annotate about um, 800, well, sorry, the, the dictionaries, all of them, you can annotate 800 signs, so 800 thousand uh, signs that are located in the continuous stream and only 100,000 of them are um, mouthings. So we complement the previous annotation set. So we have about 1 million at the moment. Maybe there was a question. 
and continuous sign language data sets like Phoenix. They have worked on a very specific domain to limit the vocabulary. How do you suggest to use sign language videos from TV shows that can be in a general domain with a large vocabulary? Well, that's a good question as well. So the Phoenix data set is on the web domain and things actually work there. So even translation and continuous recognition, but because it comes from a very, very restricted vocabulary. And when you apply the same techniques on um, this kind of open vocabulary domains, things fail uh, quite like they collapse basically like nothing works and we're, like there's no right answer how to work with a general domain with a large vocabulary but our current approach is to scale up the size of the vocabulary and the size of the number of videos per sign as much as possible so the, the two works i've shown so far are just trying to localize more and more signs and hopefully when you put them all together like now we have one million signs and distributed around um, more than a thousand, I think about three, four, maybe five thousand um, words, so not necessarily signs, so maybe you can merge some of the classes. Um, but yeah, I think this is like the baby steps so that we can actually capture the uh, full vocabulary. And then once you have that, you can learn representations from the video, then you can probably uh, tackle continuous recognition later. And it's a very unbalanced long tail distribution. So some some signs actually we recognize really well, but uh, there are very uh, low resource signs where we have to improve. Okay, um, some applications for this work with dictionary spotting is that you can, for example, use a um, dictionary, like you can record yourself and you, you just, you're a sign language learner and you forgot how uh, this, this, what this sign meant. You can retrieve all the all the examples of it in a continuous uh, sign language video. You can look up also in a dictionary by uploading a video and get the the meaning. Another application is, as I said, there are variations in the the way a single sign can be a uh, single word can be signed. For example, you have the word business. The first two are the same and the third in the dictionary has a different form and when you plot the dissimilarity for each of them to, uh, with the um, continuous video you have a small peaks in the first two ones and no peak in this one so you can identify okay this was from the first version another application uh, which we kind of preliminarily looked at is to identify similarities between two different sign languages so you have here faux amis, which means they have similar like uh, similar signs in terms of hand motion and shape, but they they mean different things in those two languages. And otherwise, you also have these iconic signs where they can be common across multiple sign languages. So you can potentially identify the percentage or help linguistic analysis. Okay, with that, uh, I'll go to the third work, which is yet another um, sign localization method on a continuous stream. But just to summarize the two previous works, we were looking at subtitles to find candidate words, either for mouthing cues or dictionary cues, but they don't use uh, in either case the context. So they're only looking neighbor, uh, window per window, but they don't look at the neighboring um, frames or uh, words. And the ones that aid, the ones that do use context, uh, as we talked about, are using the Phoenix uh, weather domain dataset, where they've looked at sequence-to-sequence uh, -sequence or transformer architectures for translation, going from video to text. And as I said, we, if we apply these methods to our data, it doesn't work. And that's what we first show in this paper. Uh, we train that model on our data with the subtitles that are weakly aligned already and with a large vocabulary. You get uh, ground truth sentences like this in black and then the prediction of the transformer model in this case in blue and I'm, I'm highlighting the words that are correctly identified in the predictions and most of the times it's like one word out of the sentence, right? And the rest is just a very generic sentence or repetitions very common words so it doesn't really make sense so 
we trained this model uh, and it didn't perform well. Um, so it was like 20% of the subtitle words were correct, for example. Um, but what we realized is that this can be used for an, as another localization, thanks to the attention and the transformer architecture. So I'll just wait for this okay, uh, animation to finish. Uh, what happens is that for each, when you train for, from video to text, for each um, word in the prediction, you have um, an attention uh, signal, which is the number of, uh, which is as big as the number of uh, frames in the video. And we know from uh, subtitles, if we are like, allowed to use the subtitles, the, the intersection between the ground truth and the prediction. So we know that no is not in the ground truth. So we only know that token army could be there. We look at the attention score and they peak in different times as the maximum. And we, we look qualitatively that this corresponds really to the sign when the it kind of provides an alignment between the signs and the, the, the words. So guess what? We have another sign localization mechanism, in this case using context also but trained for a proxy task of uh, translation. So it potentially allows us to go beyond um, the vocabulary in the dictionary or the vocabulary of things that are mouthed. So it's more an open vocabulary also. Um, so a qualitative example for the localizations and um, some quantitative experiments where uh, we also experimented with different number of transformer layers, it didn't change much. Um, but what was important is that um, this attention score, you have it from all the layers. So if you use two layers, you have them both in the attention layer one or two. Um, and the question is which one has a better alignment between video and the words. What worked out best was taking an average. So in three layers, the last layer always performed a bit worse in this case, and even much worse uh, than the first. Um, and we simply took the average and we used the two layers for simplicity. All right, so some other examples for the spotting automatically signed signs world. Okay, so what we can do in this case, now that we have three methods, mouthings, dictionaries, and the third one we call attention, M, D, and A uh, in this case. Uh, you can run them on the training set. You're allowed to use the subtitles to, um, to give candidate words and candidate um, time windows. And you can use, take out these small clips and train for, in this case, 1000 way classification, test on your manually verified uh, test set. Uh, before we were at, um, Okay, we were at 40% before with the mouthings in the ECC paper. Then even with only attention, we got uh, to 54% using much less data. So 100,000 training data obtained from attention. And then if we add them all to the training, the best was usually dictionaries. If you add them all, it just uh, kept boosting the performance. And the idea now is to just densify the, the, these moments annotated more and more to improve it. Okay. Well, so far it was um, localization and using them for recognition. So recognition is like classification. And the problem was that the, the subtitles I kept saying that are not uh, aligned perfectly. Maybe there's a question. Mm. Yeah, they were just asking, I'll read it out. Uh, I didn't get why the subtitles and corresponding sign language videos directly didn't work with existing state-of-the-art models you showed. Could you please explain possible explanations for that? Okay, well, um, there are multiple explanations, but it's just that for a vocabulary, let's say, of 40,000 words and only, I don't know, less than 1,000 hours of video data, it's just not enough to learn a language model, video representation, and to produce meaningful uh, text. So um, the state of the art that we, we used, it works on 10 hours of data, which is 
nine signers, so it's the same signers in the training and test set. It's only uh, 3,000 German words and 1,000 signs. So 3,000 words versus 40,000 words. And we, even when we tried 10,000, it didn't work. And the backbone, the video um, representations there was also optimized for um, those vocabulary. Like everything was tuned there and it was enough data for a restricted vocabulary here. The main problem is the, the open vocabulary. A second problem is how do you learn a representation for that many signs? And yeah, lack of enough, lack of also, which I'm going to show the aligned subtitles. So our subtitles are maybe three seconds off. So even our ground truth when we train for translation is not perfect. And it, it's not even sentences. It's like cut off in the, in the screen as a few words um, that last three seconds, but maybe a sentence lasts longer than that. So they're not broken down into sentences. Yeah, many, many issues, but it's still work in progress for why the translation doesn't work. Okay, do you think the problem is scale? Uh, scale of both data and compute? Uh, well, compute, no, like if you let the training, it's just not going to change much, uh, but it's the data, yes, we don't have good ground truth. So the subtitles are not good enough and we don't have enough data to capture all the vocabulary. Okay. Well, thanks for asking. Um, all right. So let's talk about these subtitles, these problematic subtitles a little bit. Uh, so this will, uh, this is our upcoming work at ICCV 21. Um, where the goal this time was to align these subtitles and clean them up a little bit because they have been problematic and we've identified that they don't really match neither in time neither in context context and uh, content all the time um, so here the problem really is given the audio subtitles um, which corresponds to speech and the corresponding interpreted sign language video how can we align them so sometimes, very rarely, they can even change the order, but most of the time they follow the same order, but they are really different in length and, um, sorry, where is that? No, I didn't put that slide. Um, they are really different in length and um, the shift between the audio and the signing is not just a fixed constant. It's not always three seconds late, it's very uh, nonlinear mapping. So that's why we went for a learning-based approach after actually trying a few uh, other tricks which never worked. Um, the idea is that we can use all this information which we're given, so the audio location of the subtitle for a 20-second window, we say 111 here when it's uh, the audio sub, uh, subtitle location and zero everywhere else, and some pre-computed features from the video, and uh, the text that we're trying to align. The output we expect is another binary vector where the ones correspond to actually where they align rather than where it aligned to the audio. And this is basically a transformer uh, architecture, except a slight difference from traditional, well, more conventional way of using transformers for vision and language. You have the video stream on the decoder side and the text in the encoder side. That's why we called it an inverted transformer. Um, because the advantage of it is that the decoder outputs, the, the size of the decoder output is as big as the video. So there's hopefully a linear mapping between the input and output because this is also the size of the video. Uh, the downside is that it only deals with a single sub subtitle at a time. So there's one subtitle here and one uh, search window around that. Uh, what we do to, because our goal is to actually apply this on an hour long video. so. TV shows in our case lasts about half an hour to one hour. And if you apl apply individually the subtitle aligner transformer, which is SAT, to let's say this time timeline here, if you apply them individually, they can even overlap, right? So we, we know that they shouldn't. So we do a global optimization step with dynamic time warping to resolve these. So that's the second line. And the ground truth is the third line. And 
qualitatively and quantitatively it just gets better. So the main kind of quantitative result from this paper was this table where um, let's look at single metric um, using SAT versus the, with the global alignment as I showed in the previous slide gives a big boost and the main course, um, comparison is to the previous work of um, this 38 where it's only using the region input nothing about the text so it's just supposed to look at the prosodic cues you know when you lower your arms maybe it, it stops a sentence so the next sentence will start those kind of cues um, and that performs much worse um, and some heuristics based approach uh, which is also uh, performing worse but here you can in the first row you can see how bad the audio alignment is so it doesn't overlap so 50 this is like counting when it's correct uh, with a 50 percent overlap with the signing and subtitle and for translation training this is what we used training uh, with very um, unaligned data so hopefully we'll get better numbers with this one then we will clean up the data to have video sentence alignments that we can train for translation a bit better. Uh, well, so this was alignment. I'll just go briefly over a few um, other tasks in sign language analysis other than um, recognition and um, yeah, using subtitles basically. Here we have um, the tokenization task. So this project led by Katrine. And you can find the project page with code and models and demo and so on. Uh, the task here is finding boundaries between each sign in a continuous stream. So you have the ground truth and prediction here, which, um, which works with some convolutional neural networks on uh, labeled data in this case. But yeah, so what, what you saw here is six times slow down than the original version. So it's a very fine grained uh, compared to, for example, action segmentation. It's a very fine grained uh, task. There's also motion blur and all sorts of problems. Um, but it will be really useful to set this up as a tool for linguists, for example, that uh, manually do, do this um, segmentation before even and like assigning them words, glosses. Uh, some correspondence to spoken words. So this step is largely um, it's possible to automate this step, so it will be useful. And uh, another uh, kind of goal we had for a while when dealing with more um, open domain where you have more than one signer in a video, which would be the natural case where people are signing to each other and having conversations. Uh, the task is who is signing and when, so putting a bounding box around uh, a track, a track around the person and identifying them also like ID3 and the other person was ID4 and the ID3 appeared again. So this is the diarization, which uh, also is a problem in, in speech um, to kind of generalize it to, to sign language users. All right, I think I'll, I'm gonna stop here and so that we can go to the discussion uh, with a few take home messages. So there are many open problems and the, it, um, one of them is to really scale up the recognition because we have the misunderstanding or misconception that sign language technology works, but it really doesn't. And um, there are many unknowns. And one of the uh, problems is, is data, but there are many others and having both knowledge of computer vision, machine learning and NLP, natural language processing, would hopefully um, help with more uh, collaborations between different disciplines. And yeah, what I've showed has, is really baby steps and there's a lot of improvement and the more people work on this, I think we'll have better, better results. So this is a thank you from the team, part of the team, let's say. <laughs>